Good morning. I want to start our time together with reading a couple of passages from the book of Ephesians. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only that which is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you have been sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and considerate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ, in Christ God forgave you. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. And in addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Yeah. 
We hunger for the day when with Christ we stand in glory. It won't be our glory. It will be the glory of God who we are a part of as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ who are part of the family. But the glory doesn't come through us, does it? It comes from him, shining off of us as the moon shares the sunlight. It is still God who deserves and is the source of the glory. Let's keep that straight as we win our battles and we have triumphs over our trials and we have victories to celebrate. We may hold the sword, we may wield the shield, but it is God who gets the glory. Sometimes, much more often than I would like, I don't feel adequate. I don't feel like the soldier of Christ that's talked about in those two songs. I don't feel equipped to do the battle that is before me, to go and wage war against the lies, to proclaim the truth to help set the captives free. And as long as I know that, it could be a good thing. Only if it drives me to the one who can help. And when it drives me to the one who can help, then I am equipped. And I am adequate. 
I am enough in Jesus Christ. But first, I got to admit that without him, I am not. May this be our prayer this morning, that we confess our need for Jesus. Fran, come back. <laughs> you did what I did. I forgot. Please stand as we say this together. Jesus Christ is our defense. He is our righteousness. We need him just like sheep yes, need yes. a shepherd. Oh, yes. Let's say this together. The, the Lord, Lord is my shepherd. shepherd. I, I shall not, not want. want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. 
even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. You can be seated. These kids behind me are so excited because they've just received their boxes. Have you ever thought what comes after the box? At Samaritan's Purse, we've got an incredible program after Operation Christmas Child. It's called The Greatest Journey. The purpose of Samaritan's Purse is evangelism. We just don't want to just hand out a box. Children that put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we want them to grow in their faith. We want to disciple them and raise up an army of young kids who can take their faith and share it with another child so that that person will put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. This is what it's all about, evangelism, taking the gospel to another generation. You shall love the Lord your God. Do you know that you're passing on what you've learned to another person, not just keeping the knowledge for yourself. You feel love. You feel like, you know what, I'm at home. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do right now. We always work through the local church. And when it's all said and done and the training's finished, these kids are going to be part of the church, going out into their communities, sharing their faith in Jesus Christ. The Greatest Journey is a great opportunity to impact the life of a child, teaching children how to share their faith with their friends and family around the world, raising up an army of evangelists who can take the gospel to the next generation. We praise the Lord for uh, what goes on in Samaritan's Purse. And sometimes we think the only thing that organization does is, you know, these shoe boxes. And that's not the case. Of course, they bring relief and development and all kinds of other things. And as uh, Franklin Graham was sharing, one of the things that goes with this is uh, a journey in Christ or whatever the proper name for that book is, but uh, where they teach uh, about Jesus and then help uh, the young lives be able to share what Jesus can do uh, and has done in their lives. So we praise the Lord for that. Um, if you ever go online, there are lots of testimonies of young uh, children and young adults, I guess they are today, who were touched by somebody giving them that shoebox. This, of course, is uh, collection week, meaning that if you haven't already filled a box, get it filled. Because as of Thursday... Uh, Thursday night, I'm assuming we are packing these things up to ship them off to Welland. So you need to be here. Uh, the box needs to be back here by then. And there will be more boxes. We know that there are other churches who have boxes and such that will be bringing them to get packed here and then trucked along uh, to Welland, to Wellsprings uh, in Welland. Um, but today, I want to pray over these boxes and the ones that are yet to come. Just ask God to bless them and use them in a young child's life. And mostly Africa, Linda, was that the? Okay, so they should be going to South Africa or South Africa, South America or Africa is where we're planning or they're planning on sending these boxes from Canada. Uh, so uh, pack accordingly. Um, and so, yes, you need to get them back. I'm just trying to think in my head. Now, after saying that, packing party on Tuesday, right? You want to speak to that, Linda? And then I'll pray for these. And let's pray over these boxes. And then um, we're going to hear from our sister, from uh, um, Dana, from uh, Youth Impact Center, who's going to share with us in a few moments. Father God, we just ask that you would just bless these boxes and the ones yet to come, O oh Lord, to be packed here. We would also ask your blessing upon the boxes that, that are going to arrive at, at Wellspring, O oh Lord, and those that get loaded up and trucked elsewhere to centers 
in Canada and so forth, and eventually we'll make it to places around this world, Lord. But Father, we pray for each one of these boxes that what's inside it and the message that goes with it, O oh Lord, about Jesus, Father, that that message would touch the heart of a young child. If that child knows Christ, may it bring joy to that child and continued growth in that child's life. If the child doesn't know you yet, may it be an opportunity to reach that child for Jesus, a seed planted or harvested, maybe, Lord. We would love to see uh, harvest seeds, Father, and hear of the testimonies of, of what's taken place in people's lives who have received these shoeboxes, Father. Lord, may you bless the work of Samaritan's Purse. May you bless the work of these shoeboxes. And Father God, we just ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. I have a few announcements uh, to make before we ask Danae to come and speak to us on what's taking place at the Youth Impact Center. First of all, I want to draw your attention. It's a busy time of the year, kind of, uh, especially since we're offering uh, Bible studies and a uh, Bible study on heaven, on what heaven is, is like and all about. Uh, again, we offer that at, uh, on Sunday mornings, just finished before the service started at 9 o'clock. If that's the best time for you, come on out and be a part of that. We offer it Sunday evenings at 6.30 online, and tonight we'll meet at 6.30 online. How to get into uh, to Google Meet is right there, the information in your bulletin or program. If you haven't got one of those, there's some more out here. Uh, we'd love to have you as a part of that. Or you can come again in the evening at 7 o'clock Tuesday night here at the church, and we're meeting uh, in the fireside room. If the numbers grow a little bit more, we'll probably come uh, into this room uh, to look at that. So that's the one thing going on within our church, and it's exciting. I don't know about you guys. Maybe you're not quite as excited yet. Those have been thing because it as it opens, but having seen this whole thing, it's exciting to be reminded and maybe to know a little bit more about heaven will be like because we those of us who believe in Jesus Christ that's our future our future is in a new heaven and a new earth and sometimes we get we lose sight of that and we think that this world that we live in is all that there is it's not we are only passing through so to speak and so I encourage you to come on out and learn about heaven because it's probably not what you think it is and uh, as what uh, Chip Ingram will say, uh, maybe you are, and maybe you've been good, and you studied all this stuff, but come on out and enjoy it. Enjoy the fellowship, too, that goes with uh, gathering together. Also, uh, Women's Step Study is continuing. It is still a place you can come and join. Uh, probably starting in December, that won't be the case. It will get closed because uh, it gets into the uh, deeper stuff and People will have some deep things to share, I'm sure, and uh, we don't want that shared all over the place or with somebody new. So that's protection. That's why it, the study or the numbers get shut off at a certain point in time. But right now, you can come and uh, learn uh, how Jesus wants to help you uh, recover, and uh, we would encourage you to come on out and be a part of that. As we already mentioned, 1 o'clock on, tu on Tuesday, lots going on. 1 o'clock also on Tuesday, if you're not part of the, the step study, uh, then come and join Linda and hopefully other people. I don't want poor Linda to be there by herself, but come and join her, though she probably would be fine with that, but come and join her and help pack boxes, okay? Uh, shoe boxes we're talking about. Bring some extra items if you have any, as she already mentioned. Then, of course, Wednesday is Soul Sisters, our women's study that takes place once a month. There is information about that on the back of your bulletin. Uh, you're supposed to bring your September, October live, and I'm sure if you don't have that magazine, uh, surely we'll have something uh, for you to take home or whatever it is that you need for that. So if you don't have it, don't let that be the excuse not to come out and join. The information's on the back of your program or speak to Shirley after the service. Um, also, Fresh Start. 
our food uh, uh, cupboard or our food program that we have now uh, is at four o'clock on on that same Wednesday, busy day again. Uh, for uh, if you want, if you need food, or if you know anybody who needs some fresh food, and remember it's fresh food, it's vegetables and such, and we hand out uh, a wonderful recipe with that, uh, so that people and in the, in the ingredients and how to put it all together and all of that. Uh, I want to encourage you to come out, and it's not just for those that. Uh, maybe can't afford. Now, if you can afford the food, we would ask that you would donate towards um, getting the fresh stuff. But if you want to get your lettuce, carrots, and all of that, we had a great number, uh, ran out of food the week uh, last time we did it. So we tried to add more to that. So uh, come on out, um, and we hope, well, we hope to run out again, actually, but that means we're doing a good job. So that's Fresh Start. I also want to remind you of underground youth that takes place uh, each and every uh, Thursday night or speak to Mitchell if you want to know more about that. If you're wondering where Mitchell and Victoria are, they're downstairs in junior church uh, uh, running or teaching the, the, Ju- the Joy Time children. And that's all the information, except again, let me remind you that you need to get those shoe boxes back in. We don't appreciate it when somebody shows up on Friday after, I don't know who's trucking them to Welland, but, or whatever, shows up Friday without, and they're all gone. And so if that's the case, you're going to be making a trip uh, to Welland. If you don't want to make that trip, then you need to get them here. And they're probably done too sometime that week. Right, Linda, on Saturday or something probably? And that's all that I'm going to say about that. Maybe not, but that's all I'm going to say right now about that. Um, And I'm going to ask, uh, we'll get it in just a second, Tom. I'm going to ask Dana to come and speak to us. I have a very quiet voice, so I want to make sure that everyone can hear me. Uh, Good morning. Thank you so much for having me here, Pastor Peter and all of you. If you don't know who I am, I am Danae. I'm the executive director of the Youth Impact Center here in in Dunville. Um, I just want to share a little bit of all the amazing things that are happening um, with our students in this town and at the center. Um, Obviously, this has been a really troubling last two years for our community and the world, um, especially for our students in our town. Um, in During the time of lockdowns and the pandemic, the center wanted to make sure that we didn't stop our programs, that we didn't just cut off all ties from our students because we know how much our students need contact, how much our students need people in their lives, invest in their lives, and obviously they were out of school, so we wanted to make sure that we were doing things from them and doing wellness checks to make sure that they're okay and that um, they have someone to listen to them or hear what's going on if they were going through something. So this last year, we were able to deliver over 100 care packages a week to our students, not just in Dunville, but in the surrounding areas, all the way to Cayuga and Welland. Um, So after the end of all the lockdowns and pandemic and once the summer hit, we had delivered over 3,000 care packages to our students in this town. And when I say care packages, I don't just mean, oh, like here's a little gift of just um, a candy and a drink. No, we, we made sure that we provided snacks and food. Because some of our students, all they usually get during the week is when they go to school and they have their meals in, in, um, in the school system. But because school was out, we were afraid that some students were not getting the, the nutrition that they needed at home. So we had um, sandwiches, pre- sandwiches pre-packed. We had water and juice boxes. We had granola bars. We had fruit and veggies to make sure they were not just eating junk food because if they were like me in lockdown, that's all I ate. I don't know about you, but <laughs> that um, the few pounds were gained during those times. So I wanted to make sure that um, kids were actually getting food that they, um, healthy um, nutrition, nutrition food that they needed during the, during the lockdown. So that was during our lockdown. And then once summer hit, we wanted to make sure that since kids could be outside and we could be doing things again, we wanted them to be outside and getting the vitamin Indeed, that they needed, getting the social interaction that they needed, getting um, just all of that energy that was locked inside for so many months um, out and just letting them run in the sun and having fun with kids. So we, um, we partnered with River's Edge Haven of Hope, which is new in our town um, on Highway 3. Um, we partnered with them during the summer, and we were out there every week during the summer, nine weeks of summer. We had over 50 kids coming to our day camp. We called it Survival Day Camp because 
well, it was a survival <laughs> that we made it through this entire um, pandemic. And kids came, they got to ride the horses, they got to feed the horses, they got to um, hang out with the horses and paint the horses. Um, they had a Bible study every single week where they learned something new of a story in the Bible. And I just want to let you know, there's a lot of students in our town that don't even understand or have ever heard of the story of Jonah and the well. And so some students were hearing that for the first time this summer. They were hearing all the different um, amazing stories that we might have grown up in Sunday school and they've never heard. So we wanted to make sure that we were um, letting them know all these amazing stories and, and, and interacting it with something in their, pers- their, their life that they, that's impacting them today. Um, and then during the rest of the week, we had junior high and senior high outings where we took kids to Canada's Wonderland. We took kids bowling. We took kids um, on hikes to make sure that they're getting the physical exercise they needed. Um, and we had, it was a moment where I felt like a mom where my kid was getting shipped off on the bus. And I looked at my um, child and youth director and I was like, why am I crying for kids going on a bus? And she's like, because we haven't seen that for over 18 months that we're able to ship kids off on a bus to go somewhere and have fun and to be able to interact with each other and to be able to go outside of Dunville. Some of our kids that went on our trip to Canada's Wonderland this summer had never left Dunville area. They've never went past Toronto. So them going to Canada's Wonderland was a big moment in their lives. And I hope that it happens again for them. But that's what we do at the center is we're trying to provide um, chances and opportunities for these kids to have experiences, not just with our volunteers and experiences with God, but experiences in life where it equips them for a life's journey. Um, Our vision um, at the center is we share the love of Jesus through our words and actions. And sometimes the actions are bigger than the words with our students, and then the words come after. So we, want to make sure, we wanted to make sure that these kids saw love of Jesus this summer, and through all of our activities, through the time that we spent with these kids. Um, so that was just a recap of our summer, and thank God that we're able to be with our students currently in our actual programs. We don't have to be on Zoom anymore, which is a blessing in itself. Um, we are actually in our, uh, our center and we're doing programs. We have programs on Tuesdays, programs on Wednesdays, programs on Thursdays, and programs on Fridays. Um, and making sure these kids have every chance they can to um, have interaction with a volunteer, a staff member, and sharing, uh, hearing the love of Jesus through our stories and having a hot meal, um, sitting down and having community with our staff and volunteers and each other, because a lot of these kids um, don't understand what it means to sit at a table and have supper together as a family. So we're trying to bring that back into their lives. And the biggest thing that's going on right now um, is our Christmas blessings. So I love Samaritan's Purse, and I've always loved it, and I think it's an amazing cause. And so I said, hey, why don't we do something like that for our students in our town. So right now we call, what do we call our Christmas blessing boxes? And so every year we, um, we get kids to fill out what their wish list is for Christmas and what they would like to see because some of these kids will never um, either get Christmas presents or they just feel, um, they feel weird or nervous to ask their parents because um, some of them don't have enough money to get them something for Christmas. So we wanted to make sure we, every kid gets an opportunity. So last year we did it and kids filled out their Christmas wish list and we had 100 kids get free Christmas gifts last year. So we had them wrapped and under the Christmas tree and at the programs they were able to get a Christmas present and then other kids were delivered to their house on Christmas Eve. So that was an amazing thing they were able to do for our students during this time and we're doing it and now this this season, so pray that um, individuals, like you were saying, get their boxes in and their Christmas presents in. Um, and another big thing right now, I don't know if you heard, but I, I sadly am leaving the Dunville Youth Impact Center. Um, I've loved the two years that I have been at the center. Um, I pray that um, the next person that comes is doing things to equip the students of our town and sharing the love of Jesus and in, 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 Um, building the center on what God wants, not on what we want alone. Um, So one of the big prayers we have right now is just pray for the board search committee as they are currently um, doing interviews for the center. Um, I would stay as long as I could, but my my husband is a youth pastor at Calvary um, Pentecostal Church, and he just became the lead pastor of a church up in Bracebridge. So when God calls you, you have to go, um, right? And so that's what we feel like we have to do. And so just pray for our board as they're finding the right fit, the person to come in and to lead the center um, post-COVID. That's what I kind of say. I live through COVID and like someone else will come to lead through post-COVID. So pray for someone to come that um, has a heart for students, but a bigger heart for God. 
to lead them in to um, serve the, the, the students in our community. Um, the next big um, prayer request is for our students. COVID was a hard thing for everyone. And a lot of people said that students are so, um, they can just pick up where they left off and they are good and they're resilient. But we are seeing that's not the case. We're seeing a lot of our students starting to speak up about what happened during COVID and when they're in lockdown and their mental health and their family situation and their friends um, situation. And so I just, I just ask that you, you start to pray for our students. There's a lot of kids that need um, counseling, but there's a lot of counseling um, areas that are so booked up that they can't even get them in until the end of 2022. And so it's a big need in our community and it's a big need around in Welland in Cayuga and Caledonia and St. Catharines, they're all booked up. And so we need to pray that um, these students are getting um, the, the, the help that they need when it comes to talking to someone, when it comes to getting um, the help, when it comes to medical or just counseling or just having a mentor. So pray for our students and their mental health. And then lastly, and not, and not um, least, pray for our, just our students and our, and our, our volunteers and our staff. Because we can tell that sometimes when you are dealing with a lot of darkness and you're dealing with a lot of that um, constant um, pain that you see from your students, it can really take a toll on, on mentors and it can take a toll on staff and, and volunteers that work with youth. Um, even uh, COVID probably took a toll on your pastor just with all the things that he heard and pe what people are struggling with. So I just, um, I just ask to pray for our staff and volunteers because if we can't take care of ourselves, then we can't help students in a healthy way. And that is our goal, to make sure that we are healthy, we're helping students and providing a safe place for them to come and talk and um, to be a part and hear the love of Jesus through what we are doing. So yeah, that is all I have for you today. Thank you so much for having us, uh, for having me. Um, if you want to hear more or if you want to volunteer with us anytime, just come talk to me after service. So here you go. Let me have a word of prayer. <laughs> Father God, we thank you for the Youth Impact Center. And I know there have been people here over the years that have worked hard in that center at various uh, positions and things. Uh, we thank you for Danae as she has uh, worked there over the last couple of years, oh Lord God, and presented great leadership in, in that time, Father, along with other volunteers and other uh, leaders, Father. But we pray for the center. We pray as they, as she asked, as they look for a new leader there, uh, oh Lord God, may you bring somebody along with uh, to grow and to, as she said, in this hopefully post-pandemic world that we're entering into, uh, to be there for the children and create the programming and such that will help those children, first of all, come to you, O oh Lord, that's our goal, but also have good mental health and all of those things, Father, a place that is safe to hang out and all of that. Father, I want to pray for Danae as she and her husband, Nathan, uh, start a whole new work with you, O oh Lord God. And Father, may you be with Pastor Nathan as he takes up this church, O oh Lord God. And uh, may he be a, a great visionary there and help lead uh, a strong ministry in that area, O oh Lord God. We just would pray that in Jesus' name. We also pray that, Father, you'll bring along the volunteers and uh, finances and all of those things that the boxes, the care packages there that we'll pack some of those too, oh Lord God. And uh, Father, be a blessing not only around the world through the shoe boxes here, oh Lord, but right here in Dunville and its surrounding area, Father. We thank you for the Youth Impact Center and the ministry that it has in this community. Father, bless it in Jesus' name, amen. And I'm going to ask Tom if you want to come and bring uh, today's offering. Let's bow our heads. Father God, we thank you for this offering, O oh Lord. And we thank you, O oh Lord, for the blessings that allow us to give back to you, O oh Lord God. The provisions that you have provided, Father, for each and every one of us. Father, we present these tithes and these offerings, O oh Lord, and we ask that you would use them to bring glory and honor to you, O oh Lord God, that others would come to know Jesus Christ, whether here in this area where this church does ministry or around the world where we do ministry through the different mission organizations that we support, Lord. May you bless this offerings and tithes, and may you bless those that are giving, O oh Lord. 
We just would ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. If you want to turn with me to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 5, uh, we're going to look at that today. I see I have lots of water here with me today. I could make a comment, but I won't make a comment on that. Um, but if you want to turn with me to 1 Corinthians, as we've been looking through, we're in chapter 5. We're going to look at 5 and 6 over the next uh, two weeks. Okay, machine, stay open. Technology is wonderful until it decides to do its own thing. Um, see, it saves us paper. That's why I use this <laughs> instead of uh, printing it all out on my uh, print. Uh, the church, as we know in Corinth, uh, was not only a divided church. We know that this church uh, had division in it. Paul is writing to it, talking about that. We've already talked about some of that division. But it was also a disgraced church. And this is what we're approaching here in chapter 5 and 6. There was sin in the assembly. And sad to say, everybody knew about it. But the church was slow to do anything about it. And no church is perfect. If it is, don't join it because it will no longer be perfect. Um, but human imperfection must never be an excuse for sin. Just as parents discipline their children in love, so local churches must exercise discipline over the membership of that assembly. Uh, church discipline is not a group of pious policemen. That's not what it's meant to be. Sometimes it is turned into that, but it's not meant to be that. Out of catch to the criminal, that's not what it's about. Rather, it is a group of brokenhearted brothers and sisters seeking to restore an erring member of that family. That's what it is about. And since some of the members of the Corinth uh, church did not want to face the situation and change it, Paul presents to us, to the church, three important things that we need to consider. Three important considerations. And as I said, we're going to look at those over the next uh, few weeks. Um, I know it's the next two weeks because I've already got the other one. The next part of this, part B, uh, pretty much finished. But the first thing he talks about is consideration is we need to consider the church. When we're talking about church discipline, uh, hard truth and stuff, well, the first consideration, Paul says, is we need to consider the church. And he starts this in, in chapter 5, verses 1 to 3. Let me read that for you. I can hardly believe the report about sexual immorality going on among you. Something that even pagans do not do. I am told that a man in your church is living in sin with his stepmother. Uh, you are so proud of yourselves, but you should be mourning in sorrow and shame. And you should remove this man from your fellowship. Even though I am not with you in person, I am with you in spirit. And as though I were there, I have already passed judgment on this man. Before I pick this up, let's bow our heads in prayer. Great Almighty God, it's hard for us when we talk about church discipline. It's hard for us to talk about it. It's hard for us to actually carry it out because we want to show love. We want to show grace. But oh Lord, as Paul mentions here, as Paul's going to talk to us about, there are times where we need to discipline our members, oh Lord God. So, Father, as I speak today, I pray that you give me the right words, but I also pray that, Lord, that as we hear those words, that we would interpret them correctly, O oh Lord, that this is you speaking to us, you trying to teach us so that we can be a place of worship, that we can be a place of Jesus Christ, that we can be a place that honors you, not a place of sin, not a place of condoning or political correctness, in our world today. So Lord God, may you guide us as we look to these, uh, these next two weeks, as we look to the scripture that Paul has for us. Amen. 
What will this sin that Paul is talking about do to the church? Is certainly an important consideration. Christians are called to be saints. Back in, in chapter 1, verse 2, Paul talks about us being saints. And this means holy living to the glory of God. If a Christian loves his church or she loves her church, they will stand by a, 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 a they will stand by, they will, yeah, let me read my words again that I've written. They will not stand by and permit sin. Get my tongue around these things. <laughs> to weaken it and perhaps uh, ruin its testimony, ruin the testimony of the church. So how should we respond when we are considering the church? Because that's what he's asking about here. Paul gave three specific instructions for the church to follow in this chapter. In verse, verses one and two, uh, we are to mourn over the sin. He says, I can hardly believe uh, the report about the sexual immorality going on among you, uh, something that even pagans don't do, he talks about in that first verse. I'm told that a man in your church is living in sin, meaning having sex with his stepmother. Uh, you are so proud of yourselves. So obviously they were thinking this is a good thing. It's like some in our community that think it's a great thing that there's you know, pastors that are homosexual and they're pastoring a church in our community down the street. This would be, we could have put this in today's vernacular of that, but Paul chooses this sin of this man because that's what's going on. But you should be mourning, he says, in sorrow and shame. You shouldn't be glorifying in this. Look, we've got this guy in our church that's living with his mother and having sex with her because that's what Paul's talking about here. That's what was going on in this church. And you should remove the man from your fellowship, he says. This is the word here used for mourning, means mourning over the dead. We should be mourning over the sin like we mourn over the dead, which is perhaps the deepest and most painful kind of personal sorrow. It's not something to be excited about this sin. Sin isn't something to be glorified. It's something to be mourned. And instead of mourning the people of Corinth, they had become puffed up. They were boasting of the fact that their church was so open, was so open-minded. They're, you know, as I said earlier, in our vernacular, we say, oh, look at our church. We're so politically correct. We allow sin in our church. That even fornicators could be members in good standing. And I know churches. As I said, we have two of them, at least that I know in our community, and one of them which has a pastor who lives in sin. And they're excited about that. You hear their members' posts, and they're celebrating that fact. The sin in this question was one of incense, incest. I said to all of, somehow I've lost the way of pronouncing words yesterday. I, it happened somewhere along the way. Uh, but incest, a, a, a professed Christian and a member of this church was living with his stepmother in a permanent alliance. In other words, he was having sex with his stepmother. That's what he was doing. Let's put it in today's language. We can clean it up, but that's what was going on. Since Paul does not pass judgment, though, on the woman, we can assume that the woman was not a member of the assembly and she may not have even been a Christian. Paul doesn't talk about the stepmother in this case. This kind of sin was, of course, condemned. If we read all the way back to the Old Testament, God has condemned this kind of sin. If you look at uh, Leviticus 18, 6 to 8, uh, you must never have sexual relations with a close relative. For I am the Lord. Do not violate your father by having sexual relations with your mother. She is your mother. You must not have sexual relations with her and do not have sexual relations with any of your father's wives for this would violate your father. God is quite clear in that. 
And to drive it even home even more in Leviticus, it says, if a man violates his father by having sex with one of his father's wives, both the man and the woman must be put to death. Now, we would all think that that's, and I'm not telling you to go out and put these people to death, okay? Because we live in the New Testament, which is grace. Not that we should allow the sin, and I'm going to talk about that, but we need to show grace that they can repent and come back to God or come to God in the first place. Then he also tells the church, listen, guys, you are glorifying something that even the pagans, even the unchurched, even the unbelievers think is disgusting. Just think about that. He, he's shaming the church, Paul is. You think this is okay. You've let it happen. You think it's okay, this sin. Even the outside world thinks it's sin. And it's not right. Whenever a Christian brother or sister sins, it is time for the family to mourn and seek to help the fallen believer. That's what we're to do. Galatians says, dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently, humbly help that person back onto the right path and be careful not to fall into the same temptation. Share each other's burdens and in this way, obey the law of Christ. See, the offending brother in Corinth was dead. As far as the things of the Lord were concerned, he is dead. He was out of fellowship with the Lord and with those in the church who were living separated lives. So the first thing that we need to do is mourn. We need to cry over this. We need to mourn over it. The second thing is we need to judge the sin. Now notice I said the sin, not the sinner, but the sin. Even though I am not with you in person, I am with you in spirit. And as though I were there, I have already passed judgment on this man. In the name of the Lord Jesus, you must call a meeting of the church. I will present with you, uh, I will be present with you in spirit. And so will the power of, the whole, of our Lord Jesus Then you must throw the man out and hand him over to Satan so that his sinful nature will be destroyed and he himself will be saved on the day the Lord returns. Well, Christians are not to judge one another. Matthew tells us in 7, 1 to 5, right? Do not judge others and you will not be judged for you will be treated as you treat others, the standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. Well, Christians are not to judge one another's motives in ministry. We are certainly expected to be honest about each other's conduct. In my own personal ministry, I've never enjoyed. I don't, I don't know too many pastors that have enjoyed having to initiate church discipline But since it's a commanded in the scriptures, we must be obedient to God and set our personal feelings aside. And of course, Paul describes here the official church meeting at which this offender was dealt with and according to the divine instructions he's dealt with. Public sin must be publicly judged and it must be condemned. For our Lord instructs about discipline. We just need to look to Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 to 20, which say this. If, any, if another believer sins against you, go privately and point out that f- offense. So the first thing you need to do, Jesus, these are Christ's words, right? Is go privately and talk to that person who is offended. Secondly, in in the other person listens, it says, and confesses it, you have won the person back. 
But if you are unsuccessful, in other words, if the person doesn't listen, take one or two others with you and go back again. So that everything you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. So didn't work when you went privately, then go back with somebody else. And if that doesn't work, if that person still refuses to listen, take your case to the church. And that means take it to the elders and ultimately to the full body, and then if he or she won't accept the church's decision, treat that person as a pagan or a corrupt tax collector. Don't let the sin be swept under the rug. For after all, this sin in this church was known, right? The sin was known, and and it was known far and wide, even among the unsaved, what was going on, that this church had a guy living with his stepmother in a sexual relationship. Do we comprehend that, what's going on? The church was to gather together and expel the offender. Note the strong words that Paul takes. If we read it from the King James, it uses things like take away from among you, deliver such as one until Satan, purge out, put away. Paul did not suggest that they handle the offender gently. Often that's our choice. We try to handle things gently. Of course, we assume that the first thing the spiritual leaders had done of this church was sought to restore that person, had gone one-on-one and done the two or three together and tried to gently restore this person. But he hadn't come. He hadn't repented. This was to be done by the authority of Jesus in his name. And not simply on the authority of the local church. Church membership, you see, people being part of a church family is a serious thing and must not be treated carelessly or lightly as it is today. What does it mean to deliver Christian unto Satan? Well, it does not mean to uh, deprive him of salvation since the church doesn't grant salvation. I can't give you salvation. Only Jesus Christ can. Only through your belief in Christ can you be saved. When a Christian is is in fellowship with the Lord and with the local church, he enjoys a special, though, protection from Satan. But when he is out of fellowship, when he is blatantly sinning, out of fellowship with God, And excommunicated from the local church, he is fair game for the enemy, for Satan. God could permit Satan to attack the offender's body so that the sinner, uh, a sinning believer, would repent and return to the fold. That's what we want to see, isn't it? Because that's what's most important. The second thing that we, or third thing that we need to consider. Uh, that Paul talks in this consideration of the church and how to handle this is to purge the sin. Right? You're you're boasting about this terrible thing. Uh, Don't you uh, realize that that this sin is like a little yeast that spreads through the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast by removing the wicked person from among you. And then you will be like fresh batch of dough made without yeast, which is what you really are. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. So let us celebrate the festival, not with the old bread of wickedness and evil, but with the new bread, Paul writes, of sincerity and of truth. When I wrote to you before, I told you, Paul goes on to write, I told you not to associate with people who indulge in sexual sin. But I was talking about unbelievers who, I wasn't talking about unbelievers who indulge in sexual sin or are greedy or cheat people 
or worship idols. You would have to leave this world to avoid people like that. I meant that you are not to associate with anyone who claims to be a believer yet indulges in sexual sin or is greed. That's pretty tough stuff that Paul's writing here for us. Or worship idols or is abusive or is a drunkard or cheats people. Don't even eat with such people, he's saying. It isn't my responsibility to judge outsiders, Paul says, but it is certainly is your responsibility to judge those inside the church, inside of the family who are sinning. God will judge those who are outside. That's God's responsibility. But as scripture says, you must remove the evil person from among you. The image here, of course, is of the Passover supper. Jesus is the Lamb of God who shed his blood to deliver us from sin. Remember back to the story, the the Jews in Egypt were delivered from the death by the application of the blood of the Lamb to the threshold of the door. Following the application of that blood, the the Jewish families ate the Passover supper. One of the requirements was that no yeast would be found anywhere in their dwellings. Even the bread at the feast was to be unleavened, meaning it wasn't to have any yeast in it. You see, the leaven is a symbol of sin here. The yeast is a symbol of sin. Any of you baked with yeast, baked bread or whatever, know that when you put that um, yeast in there, it permeates through it all. It's actually very interesting watching it work, right? And it rises the dough. It is a small but powerful. It works secretly. It puffs up the dough. And it spreads. And the sinning church member in Corinth was like that yeast, is what Paul is saying. He was defiling the entire loaf of bread. He was defiling the whole congregation. Today, we we try to think, oh, well, it's just me. So what I do doesn't affect anybody else. Well, I'm sorry to say what you do affects everybody else. You don't do anything that won't affect somebody else in your life. The choices that you make. It was like a cancer in the body that that needed to be removed by drastic surgery, Paul is saying. The church must purge itself of this old leaven, of this old yeast, that this the things that belong to the old life before we trust Christ. We must also get rid of the malice and the wickedness. And replace them with sincerity and with truth. As a loaf of bread, Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians 10, 17. And though we are many, we all eat from the one loaf of bread, showing that we are one body. So as a loaf of bread, the local church must be pure as possible. Now, we're not perfect and we're not without sin, but we must try to strive to be. However, the church must not judge the condemned, those outside of the faith. See, what I usually see in churches is that we condemn the people out there living on the street who don't know Jesus, haven't got Jesus in faith. We're condemning them. Meanwhile, we allow those things to happen right in our midst. The judgment is in the future, and it is God that will do the judging. 1 Corinthians 5, 9, 13, Paul emphasizes once again the importance of the separation, that we are as Christians to be separate from the world. Christians are not to be isolated, but to be separate. We cannot avoid contact with sinners, but we can avoid the contamination of sinners. If a professed Christian is guilty of sins named here, the church must deal with him or her. Individual members are not to associate, Paul is saying, with him or her. Or get mixed up, it says. They are not to eat with him which could refer to private hospitality, but probably refers to the Lord's Supper that we're not to take the Lord's Supper 
with somebody who is actively in sin. Church discipline is not an easy or popular, but it is important, unfortunately. Well, I know it's not unfortunate. It is fortunate that it is there, but it's unfortunate that we have to do it. But it's important, people. If it is done properly, and we here try to strive to do it properly, God can use it to convict and restore an an erring believer. Because if you were to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, 1 to 11, Paul indicated that this man in 2 Corinthians, this man did repent and be restored to fellowship. So there is hope. But there is also a process. And we need to follow that process. And if somebody is sinning, we will need to handle that. First by going privately, then by taking a couple people with us and talking to the elders and the church and so on. And if they don't want to repent, don't want to turn from their sin, and not just sexual sin, there's lots of things that we need to take into consideration, then we will have to ask them to leave. Because they are contaminating the fellowship. And we cannot have sin contaminating the fellowship of believers. And having people err and become sinful themselves. We cannot say, oh, look at us. We have a guy having sex with his mother-in-law or his mother. And be proud of that. Same as, as I said, as there are churches in the community that are proud of other forms of sexual sin and say, look at us. We've got a pastor. He lives in sin, but it's all right. We love. Well, you don't love because if you did, you would challenge that sin. You would ask that person to repent because clearly the scriptures say that this is sin. And it is our job to judge those that are part of the fellowship of believers. It's not my job to judge the person out there. It's my job to take that unsaved person and disciple them and bring them to Christ. And they will overcome the sin. I'm not preaching this message because it's fun. I'm preaching this message because we need to know it and learn it and not accept Sin in the fellowship. And we need to practice Matthew and what Matthew has to say. And sometimes you may not like what I'm going to say the leadership of the church needs to do. Not me, but the elders of the church need to do. Because somebody is living in sin or practicing sin. And we will need to maybe excommunicate them. That's not a fun thing to do. Let's bow our heads. Father God, we know that this is a very, you know, hard subject for us here because we also know that as Christians, we are to love and we are to show grace and we are to show mercy. But, oh Lord, you're talking about, Paul is talking about here to us and you gave him these words talking about sin, somebody who does not want to confess their sin and does not want to change. And Lord, may you help us as individuals to follow what Jesus told us to do in Matthew. May we take these, this consideration, may we consider what the effect is on the church, on the body of Christ, and not only our church here at First Baptist, if it was here, the church in Dunville. Because, you know, Father, the ones that are practicing sin... That affects the whole church, not just their church. It affects the message. And so, Father God, help us to get into your word. Help us to practice your word in love, in grace, in mercy. But also remember that we are to judge the sin. And if somebody is 
sinning, we need to judge that sin. And we may need to practice church discipline, which none of us like to do, but we may need to practice it. Father God, thank you for your word. And I just pray for everyone that is here. I pray that for those that maybe don't know Jesus yet that are here, and this has been kind of a strange, hard message for them. Lord, I pray that they find Christ and they would find integrity within our church, O oh Lord, within this family of believers, that they might find Jesus and give their heart to Christ and that allow Christ to take care of the sin in their life, O oh Lord God. For those that are here, O oh Lord, first, may we, as one of the scriptures I didn't touch this morning due to time, but may we... Look to the log in our own eye before we start looking to the speck in somebody else's eye. And Lord, that's the first thing. May we take care of those logs that are blinding us. In other words, the sins that we need to confess before you. But oh Lord, it does tell us in that verse to then go and talk to our brother or sister and help them to overcome the sin in their life. And if they refuse, Paul gives us the direction here that we need to take. But God willing, that person, whoever it is, will become like the person that Paul is talking about, that in the future, they will come back to Jesus in repentance. That's what we all want. Father God, thank you again for your word. Speak to our hearts where we need to be spoken to. We just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. And now may the grace of God, a grace which passes all of our understanding, may it touch you, may it keep you, may it bring peace to you, and may you share the joy of the Lord with all those around you. I pray that in Jesus' name.